In this video, you are going to learn about an absolutely fantastic way to set up and play Crokinole when you have eight players that are ready to duke it out. It is great for competitive play, it is great to have newer players learn from experienced players, and it is also really good even when you have a broad range of skill levels between the eight players that are present. Now most of the way through this, we are going to talk about how it works with eight players because that is ideal for the setup. But there are also some modifications you can make if you have seven or nine, if you have one extra or one less than what you'd like to have. We are also going to talk about why this is so great in so many ways, and most importantly, how you can get your hands on the documents that you are going to need to set up and do this at your house. Let's take a look. Jeremy Tracy here of Tracy Crokinole Boards. If you find this video fun and helpful, please go ahead and give us a like, a comment, a share, a subscribe. We are getting so close to being able to monetize this channel, which means that YouTube is going to be more likely to promote these videos, which ultimately means even more people are going to get exposure to the greatest game on earth of Crokinole. So thank you for all the love and support so far. Please keep it up. Now what inspired this particular video at this particular time is just a few days ago on our back deck, eight players came together and used this exact formula. We had an absolute blast. And what we did was we took, after we did the first round robin, we took the top four scores and those players duked it out in one final round in a race to nine. We will very soon release the footage of that match with commentary, so keep an eye out for that. We like to call this particular rotation setup the St. Jacob's style of Crokinole because it is at the St. Jacob's Club when we very first saw and enjoyed this particular layout. And how it works is that you end up playing matches of doubles, which is always fun, but you do it competing as a, an individual you are going to get assigned a number. So there's eight players there, everybody gets assigned a number from one through eight, and then you follow the map that we're going to share with you, and each match you are going to have a different partner and different opponents. The way it works is you will end up having one match where you are partnered once with each of the other seven players, and you are going to play against each of the other players two times. That's just how the map works out. So what you're going to do is, let's say you come to one of these events and you are assigned the number three. You will then look at the map and you will see that for match number one, you are going to set at table number one in the position to the left. Now what we did to simplify this as far as people understanding how the tables were oriented is that for match number one, players number one and five that you see on this layout those two players sat closest to the back fence and players two and six sat closest to the house. And that just made it easy to know which way, which way the map was oriented as compared to the tables. We also, what we did throughout the entire the afternoon was that players that sat closest to the back fence, they were always the player that shot first for the first round. That just saved going, oh, who should start? Just to keep it consistent and even and fair, it was always the people who sat in that position who shot first, and then it went clockwise around the table from there. Every match was four rounds, so that means that each player at the table got to start a round once, each player gets to have hammer once, nice, even, and fair way to play a match. And you always kept track of your score. At the end of each match, we're also going to share a link to the scorecard that we used, but you would write down whether you, we used the NCA style of scoring, so whether you had two, one, or zero. So if you win the round, you get two points, tie, you get one, lose, you get zero. But there was also a column for 20s. And to be clear, you didn't just write down the 20s that you yourself sank, it was how many 20s you got as a team. So let's say you won that first round, so you get two points, and between you and your partner, you know, your partner sunk three 20s and you sunk one 20, all that matters is that combined you got four, so you would put a four in there. The reason that we track 20s is so that in case we get to the end of the afternoon and two players were tied in score, and this is exactly what happened, two players were tied in score, 
that we used how many 20s you had as the tiebreaker to determine who was second place versus third place. So like I say, each match consists of four rounds, just like regular NCA tournaments, so that at the end, it could be a score 8071, uh, 6-2, and yes, it could even be tied 4-4. And in the case of a tie, you do not break the tie. You simply have your four points from that match and you carry on throughout and that way it made sure that like without playing that tiebreaker round it made sure that both tables are ending at approximately the same time and then you would rearrange to your next seat and play the next match so again let's go back to that map and look and let's say after you know your player number three after match number one you look and you see that for match number two you should be sitting at table number two in the chair to the left so all the players are going to find their seats take a few practice shots and then the next match begins and we proceed that way throughout the seven matches now this isn't the be all and end all this i'm just sharing what we did for our backyard battle so what we did was after we had played the seven matches we saw where everybody ranked one through eight in the players and what we did was we played one final match which was a race to nine so on one table we put the player who had placed first, partnered with the player who had placed fourth, and they played against numbers two and three. So just the way it worked out, Simon Dowrick lit us up, came out, in, uh, came out in first place, he actually won by one point, but Simon was in first, Roy Campbell and I were tied, but I had more 20s than he did, so I was second place, he was third place, Ron Langell was fourth place, all of us very tight, and then Jason Beerling was very close behind that. So he ended up in fifth place. So what we did on the other table was number five, partnered with number eight, and played against six and seven. So we had two final matches going. We don't have uh, we don't have footage of the consolation match, but we do have footage of that uh, of that final match. Like I say, you will see that come up on our channel very soon. So now, hopefully, between the explanation you just heard as well as the documents we'll provide the links to, you have a fairly good understanding of how this works. But now we let's let's spend a few minutes and chat about why is this so great? What why do we love the St. Jacob style of crokinole so much? I'm also going to talk about how you can modify this if you have seven players or nine players and there's also there's also some limitations as much as I love this there are some limitations so we'll talk about that as well so the highlights of why we love this so much one is that it's it's doubles I mean doubles crokinole is fantastic there's more strategy it's just a more like in my opinion and a lot of people would agree it's just a more engaging more social way to play crokinole the other thing is you get uh, the, one of the things that we love about this is just how fair it is. So you've got all these different people rather than, uh, let's say there's some weaker players, rather than having someone who's partnered with a weaker player throughout the entire, you know, all the matches, it spreads that around so everybody has the opportunity to play with different players. So it keeps it nice and fair. It's also super competitive because you are still competing as an individual. You want to win each match because you're trying to carry those points. Maybe it's just me that's competitive, but you're trying to carry those points forward to have the best possible score you can at the end of all the matches. Probably one of my favorite things about this is the coaching that goes on or the coaching, the guidance, the help that you will see the, that the newer players are learning from the more experienced players. I can tell you when we started playing competitive crokinole and we showed up at the aforementioned St. Jacob's Crokinole Club as a, you know, a beginner and then moving into that intermediate stage, um, the benefits that came from having the opportunity to partner. So there I am, I'm learning to play competitive crokinole and I have the opportunity to sit across from John Conrad, a multiple time world champion, and John was giving me pointers and suggestions about strategy and what shot selection I should make and how much that helped me build and develop and grow as a player. So that's one of the great things is the coaching that goes on and you will see players get better faster by having that help and guidance and it's also even if uh, you know even if you're playing against one of those strong players because in doubles crokinole there's no rule against table talk there's open conversation and dialogue about strategy so you're learning you're getting to hear how these top level players think or you know maybe you're not playing with John Conrad and and uh, these top players but just the strongest players in your area you're going to get to hear how they think and apply that to your game so you're going to get like I say you're going to get better 
faster. I actually find with this format, you get to know more people. You just have more interaction between the people that are there rather than having one partner you move throughout. You, because it's always mixed up and there's always three different people sitting at the table with you, you just get to know them better. But now let's really get down to the nitty gritty of probably one of my favorite things about this style of play and it is the sheer amount of trash talk that will go on. Now, I say that it is super friendly trash talk, but let's say, you know, um, Saturday I was, I was playing against Roy Campbell and he is making incredible shots. So I'm lighting him up and saying, why weren't you shooting like that when we were partners? And there's just things like that, or you know, you lose, some, you lose against someone, so then later on in the afternoon you're partnering with them and you look at him and you go, Jason, you owe me points because you whooped me eight nothing earlier. You owe me points. You better play well. And it just, you know, it's just the the camaraderie, the trash talk, the the poking and having fun just seems to escalate with this style of play. Now, even with everything that we love about the St. Jacob style of crokinole, there are a couple of downsides. So let's let's talk about that. One of the downsides is that it it is a bit of a commitment. The the eight players that are going to come together. They need to make a bit of a commitment. Like on uh, on Sunday when we played, it was between two and two and a half hours to play those seven matches, and it really wouldn't have worked well if we had had somebody show up, you know, 45 minutes after we started, and somebody else leave half hour before we're done. It works best when those people are, good. you know, what they're committed. They're like, okay, yeah, I'm there for a couple hours to play these games. Now, honestly, we probably could have done it faster, but we stopped and had snacks. It was very social. Uh, there was a lot of us hadn't seen each other for quite a while, so there was a lot of catching up. It could have been quicker, but like I say, it's going to work best if you have that commitment. The other limitation, the downside of this, is it really does work best when you have eight people. So you may be sitting there and think, well, what if I've got seven, or what if I've got nine? I've got an answer for that. So if you have seven players, all you do is you basically assign a number, doesn't matter, pick a number, make it number eight, and you say number eight is a ghost. It's an imaginary friend. So whenever you sit down and your partner is number eight, you get all 12 buttons and your opponents each get six and you play 2v1. Now, if that confuses you, we, we, if you don't know what I mean by that, we've got videos and blogs about that. We'll put links to that down below. But again, it works out fair because all seven players are going to have an opportunity to be the individual that plays by themselves against two other people. So again, it still makes it fair and it's, it's actually kind of fun. Like I don't want to play every game 2v1, but I do enjoy a 2v1 game. So you're going to, if you have seven players, you're always going to have a full match of four on one table and a match of three, 2v1 on the other table. So what if you have nine players? If you have nine players, you're going to have someone sit out, but there is a way, again, to keep that fair and keep it flowing. So what you do is player number nine for match number one, they just sit out. For match number two, they will take the place of player number eight. For match number three, they take the place of player number seven and so on and so on and so on. Now, you've probably already figured this out, the points aren't going to work out all that well. Uh, it doesn't work perfectly, but it is a way to still play, so you're not necessarily gonna have rankings at the end of the night and be able to say, oh, this person you know, did a little better than that person or whatever, but it, do it does allow you to keep things rotating and get everybody involved. Now, you may be sitting there saying, well, what if I've got six players or less? The answer is, you don't use this format, it just doesn't work. What if you've got 10 players or more? Again, you don't, you know, even with 10 players, this isn't going to work. Once you get to 11 and 12, I have seen documents that lay out how you do a 12 person rotation. So if you had 11 or 12, you would use that, and again, you just have a ghost person available. Um, but for most of us, most of the time, we're doing well to bring eight of us together. Um, and the other thing is, if you end up with 10 or more, then, you know, a singles tournament can just be a, a fan as some sort of a singles round robin can also be a fantastic way to go so with all that said I really hope that uh, you know this has inspired you to call up seven of your buddies get together somewhere and uh, you know duke it out give this give this rotation a try and see if you agree or disagree with all the awesome benefits that we've talked about and uh, most importantly I really hope that you just all have fun trash talking making good shots and bad shots all while you're playing the greatest game on earth and um, it does have some limitations so we'll talk about that again. All right. yeah are you rolling
Rolling. 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 In, um... Rolling. Rolling.